Thank you, Fred, and hello from Athens, Greece, where I'm currently located. The transatlantic trade relationship has taken some significant hits over the past few years. Tariff battles, old and new, COVID-related challenges, the political fights over trade policy that has, have certainly dominated the news. How big is really the damage to the trade relationship, which is vitally important for both the EU and the US economy? And as we set ambitious targets and an agendas for recovery on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, how, where can we count on more policy coordination? What are the challenges that need to be addressed as a matter of priority? To answer these questions, we're delighted to have with us I mean, Susan Tanger, CEO of AMCHAM EU and Chair of the European AMCHAMS, speaking for American businesses, of course, that are invested in Europe. Ambassador Ronald Gidwitz, a businessman and diplomat who served as United States Ambassador to Belgium and Acting Ambassador to the EU under the Trump administration. And Rupert Schlegelmich, Director of Trade at the European Commission, working, of course, on the EU-US trade ties. To kick off the conversation, I would like to invite Susan to, uh, to, to, to discuss uh, how do we reset the transatlantic trade relationship as part of the global economic recovery after all these significant uh, tariff battles of the past few years. Susan? Yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, well, that's a big question. So may, maybe just to put it in perspective, first of all, I mean, I think you're very right to, to mention, first of all, global economic recovery. We, we, it's called the Great Lockdown, I think, just to throw one statistic out there, first of all, is that the, the EU's GDP has dropped by a staggering 38% in recent times, uh, and the global economy is contracted by 4%. And the US, uh, the US economy, the Euro economy more by 7%. So I think absolutely, I think also, you know, how, how we reset the relationship to help with that recovery. First of all, yes, why is the reset needed? Well, the reset is indeed needed because of all these headwinds that we've seen over the last, um, the last four years, certainly escalating trade tensions and tariffs. We've had expanding restrictions on foreign investment. Uh, disputes over the future of NATO, the approach to WTO. I know we're going to go into those a little bit more, Katerina. So to answer your question, in short, how do we do this? Well, we need cooperation. We've got to build back bridges. We definitely need cooperation, whether it's on regulatory cooperation to advance trade, whether it's un um, cooperation with regard to tackling unfair market practices and anti-competitive behavior. We need cooperation on reforming multilateral institutions, um, we need to foster cooperation as well on transatlantic defence uh, and, may, and maybe finally on supply chain resilience and export controls. We definitely can cooperate there. Um, you know, I'm happy to expand a bit more, Katerina, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you. And if I may turn to Ambassador Kitwitz, you were ambassador to the EU during the pandemic, at the start of the pandemic, and uh, we did experience significant disruptions as well to, 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 to trade. Are you concerned about the future of trade and how permanent these disruptions yeah. might be even after COVID to transatlantic trade? I, I think there's a the variety of, of concerns that I have with respect to uh, the uh, Putting, putting the genie back in the bottle. I think it's going to be very difficult. Clearly, when we look at the way that the COVID pandemic has been financed, we're going to see countries across the world, and particularly in Europe, here, as well as here in the United States, with enormous deficits that have not been anticipated. And so how those deficits are dealt with will have a, a major bearing on uh, our way forward. Uh, as well, uh, the trade deficit that the United States has suffered over the course of the last several years is not is, is bound to get worse as opposed to get better, which I will, I believe will create some real friction between ourselves and the European Union. Uh, the trade deficit essentially is net net uh, $130 billion negative to the US, but uh, it's part of that deficit is offset by uh, a uh, services a services surplus, so the real goods deficit is $180 billion, but the service the service sector is under attack. The Schrems 2 decision, for example, last July, a year ago, uh, underscores the kind of uh, fragility that exists uh, with respect to, to the, the services area. Uh, 
Privacy Shield, which was a vehicle set up in 2015 to allow for uh, allow for transatlantic data flows, rep and it represents about $50 billion of uh, transatlantic trade, has been ruled illegal. And so how we deal with some of these very difficult issues and the political outfall of them <laughs> is really going to be important. Thank you. And uh, Rupert, if I may turn to you, there's no denying the tensions of the past few years, but, but we do have a new administration in the U.S. And uh, how do you see the Biden-Harris administration after it reached its 100-day 100, uh, 100 milestone? How do you assess the course that has been started for EU-U.S. relations so far? Yes, thank you. And also a thanks from my side for being able to join this interesting uh, conversation. And I have to say, the, uh, we are very encouraged to put it in, in one sentence by the start of the Biden-Harris administration. In particular, we, we are noticing that the, uh, the, the point which is made that working with allies is needed in the world trading scenario. Working with allies in a constructive way is actually also followed by some uh, initial actions. We have been able to uh, suspend the tariffs on Airbus and Boeing, the, the aircraft dispute, and we have also seen some moves elsewhere to lower the temperature, if I may say so. There are still things out there that were already mentioned. But I think it's very important that we also both are taking a hard look at the trade policy that we're having, the build back backer on the one hand, and the, EU, the new EU trade policy uh, that we have came out under the, the title of open, sustainable, and assertive. And I think now the challenge is really to go a little bit deeper and build a positive agenda which we hadn't had, I have to be very honest, in the last couple of years, and see what is actually the challenge that we have to face beyond the legacy issues on disputes. And these are issues like the green transition, and this is where the, the change in the climate policy in the US will be very important, and the digital transition, which are the two main, if you take a long-term view, uh, challenges we face. And for both, trade plays a role that I'm happy to go on deeper in the conversation. But trade must be an enabler for a greener uh, policy and for a more digitally enabled policy. And that includes also getting out of the crisis together. Not only do we have a question maybe of financial viability or, fi or fiscal viability, we also have to make sure that all these distorting, if you wish, uh, ultimately all the subsidies we're giving out now for good reasons uh, will not become permanent and distort the global marketplace on the long term. And that will be a challenge because everywhere we have now been looking uh, away about the question of what do these subsidies actually do to the global marketplace, uh, which normally we discipline through WTO and other rules. So the, co the, the, the positive agenda is there, we now have to make it work. Thank you, and you're leading us into the next uh, the next round of questions on exactly the convergences that are in trade policies that can serve as a springboard for greater cooperation. And Susan, if I may turn to you, you've argued exactly that the, to this twin transition towards a sustainable and digital economy opens up new fronts for close cooperation. Uh, what do we need to do in the transatlantic community to save? the global standards for the digital economy uh, and uh, the green standards for uh, in accordance with uh, uh, the transatlantic values and priorities. Yes, thank you, Katerina. But yeah, maybe let me touch on um, a couple of various concrete ideas from the business community on where we can really cooperate, so what we have to do. Um, so absolutely, to, to what uh, Rupert said, that we totally support green transition and digital, digital transition with regard to economic recovery. Yeah, and a couple of ideas to put out there will be artificial intelligence. That's one area to cooperate. They're important on both sides. We're not very far away. Uh, we could really work together on, create, on having a human-centric approach to, to solving this big issue. So there's sort of one concrete idea. Um, another one will be, you know, giving the concrete ideas first, clinical research. Uh, let's have some mutual recognition agreement on, the, on inspections on both sides. There's so much duplication that goes on at the moment. Uh, we could share resources, absolutely. So what we need is good clinical practice inspections to be coordinated. Another one is actually on clean technology. So in the, in the area of sustainability, Katerina, absolutely, you know, the, the speed of development that there is, we need this technology, technological advancement. But if we remove regulatory hurdles for business, we can move even faster. So if we can open dialogue between the EU and the US, this area to remove some of these burdens, this would really help. 
Uh, and then another area will be data transfers. Um, I believe you know one of my, my co-panelists here, perhaps both already mentioned the privacy shields as being one of the barriers. Um, we've got to ensure the ability to transfer personal data between the US and the EU. This is a real sticking point. It is absolutely essential, particularly for SMEs actually, rather than big companies. So we do need to come up with an alternative mechanism. I mean, it's been encouraging that Secretary Raimondo and Didier Reinders recently signed um, an agreement on that. So those are some concrete areas, if I may just briefly. Yeah, there's a lot of already convergence areas already. The US has got its trade agenda. The EU has it. So obviously, Mr. Schlegel is a far more expert than I am on that. But even if you look at what, what the, the areas uh, of convergence are in there, perhaps one, one last area would be multilateralism, which we haven't, um, I think, mentioned there. I think, believe both trade agendas, there is an area of convergence that we could work on, which is reforming uh, WTO. There you know, big areas there. We need the WTO. Um, <clears throat> if we want to move forward, this is a, a huge area of convergence in both trade policies and an area of cooperation. So I'd support that. Thank you. And Ambassador, same question to you. What do you think are the convergence opportunities in trade policy in, transatlantic, in the transatlantic agenda going forward? Well, I, let me begin by saying I agree with Susan with respect to the WTO. I think it's terribly important that we get a real resolution to a way forward so that we have a viable and workable uh, multilateral agreement on how we're going to deal with trade issues. If we don't do that, I think that there, that will cast a shadow over uh, so many other so many other issues. So that would be number one. Number two, I think there's a short term opportunity in energy. I recognize that uh, long term uh, we, we want to move to in this administration. The U.S. administration is very set upon moving to, to green. But at the same time, they're talking about uh, issues such as the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Uh, we, the United States, would like to be a would like to substitute for the gas that's being sold by Russia. There's a, there's a dual reason for doing that. First of all, it improves our balance of trade uh, and it doesn't, shouldn't damage the European balance of trade as a result, since they're importing the, and will be importing more of the Russian uh, gas. But the other issue is why are we financing Russia's buildup of uh, their military weapons? And so I think there's a, there's a, a twofer there, if you will, with respect to the short-term energy needs. And then, uh, lastly, uh, I think we, I, I, I think there's it's, it's critically important that we find a way to deal with some of these these privacy issues. Uh, right now, uh, the the loss of of uh, privacy shield, the question about standard contractual clauses, which is for the bigger cor corporations, which while haven't been attacked as as well uh, by the European Court of Justice, still are under review and question. So. Uh, data and information is critical to all of our futures, and we need to find a way to resolve that sooner rather than later. Thank you. And Rupert, if I may turn to you, uh, and same question, but uh, I would also would like to bring into uh, the agenda. The, the EU has proposed the EU-US Trade and Tech Council, and it seems that the US is warming up to the idea of structuring an effective dialogue on trade and tech issues to resolve these disputes. Uh, what are the EU priorities in this regard? And please feel free to respond to the previous points raised. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I think uh, I would like to first say that uh, I'm, I'm very encouraged also by the support for the multilateral trading system, which is in bad shape. Uh, both uh, have been Susan and the ambassador have actually said that this is important and we wholeheartedly agree because these are the rules we need for a predictable trading environment worldwide. And I'm not only talking about uh, maybe China, which uh, you know, it's, it's exploits some of the loopholes in these rules where we need new ones, but also the rest of the world. They take their cue from, from stability and a worldwide system to trade. On the more granular issues on what to do next, in particular on trade and technology, it's exactly the reason that we all have been agreeing that the digital tra trade is becoming the most uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, we have to get an idea on how to regulate the digital space, because if, if, if we fragment it further, then I think the, the, the positive elements, effects of having an economy of scales and using uh, the internet basically for trade will just diminish. And we have major differences when it comes to some of these technologies, how to deal with them, 
what technology also to make available those who don't share our values. Uh, and that starts with not so much with data privacy, because there I think we have the same values, we just have different ways to implement it. But the real difference is with some of the other less democratic societies, if you wish. Uh, and then we have the, who use some of the uh, other technologies and AI was mentioned to supervision uh, their own uh, population in a way that we would think is not democratic. So making sure that we get the best out of the internet and the digital transition, and at the same time, don't hinder the trade where we don't need to is a very delicate discussion because we see that the instruments that we are using, not only in the, in the US, we also have export controls. We denied a lot of exports to China in the last year, by the way, in some of the critical technologies, but we have to have a common vision what we should, how we should address this so we don't get into each other's hairs on these issues. Uh, that's, I think, a very important point. But it's, it's more than that. The Trade and Tech Council should also look at the very important question of standards. Again, you, we have to set standards for many of these technologies. AI has been mentioned. Artificial intelligence is one of the key ones. But there is also automotive driving, robotics, uh, quantum, and so on. And we are much more effective transatlantically to the benefit of our business if we have a shared approach to these issues and not fragmented these markets of the future. Thank you. And I love it how you all went straight to the sticking points as well, which is the next round of questions that I have for you. So how do we build this consensus on the sticking points in the trade relationship? And I would like to turn to Susan. You've singled out the tariffs part of her steel, but also welcomed the temporary suspension of the aircraft tariffs, right? Uh, the dispute at the World, World Trade Organization. Um, as two of the trade irritants, the uh, old and new, are you confident that the new two sides may reach an agreement to add uh, these disputes? Uh, that's a tricky question. I mean, I think we are optimistic. I think the, uh, the actual temporary suspension, as you just said yourself, is a very positive sign that the two sides now who are here together are ready to move towards constructively to long term solutions. So I, I believe there is a will there. I think there's more optimism in the air certainly uh, in 2021 that we can move towards something. I think both sides want to find a solution. However, we're a bit, little bit concerned about the, the time span here because four months is not long. So we're, we're really hoping for um, some speedy negotiations here. So, so what we can bury this hatchet permanently and just move on um, and stop this tit for tat. Um, you know, if we can move on and pave the way for more global rules for aeroplane manufacturing, it would be much better generally on steel and aluminium, I think that's a really important one. I mean, we're concerned at the moment about the other deadline looming, which is June 1st, which is not very far away, where in the, the counter tariffs imposed by the EU are set to double if the steel and aluminium tariffs imposed by the US have not been uh, removed. So um, no one, want, nobody wants that to happen. It has knock on effects on a whole range of what of industries with have nothing to do with steel and aluminium. So very concerned about that. What we really what we really want to see, I mean, it's an, a great opportunity to look at the overarching issue. The wider issue is global, global overcapacity in steel and aluminium. And that's the issue on which the two sides should be working together. So you asked also earlier about areas for cooperation. That's exactly where we should be working together. Um, I mean, we've been actively speaking out since 2018 now for an exemption uh, for the EU and have proposed this national security argument. So we really advocate uh, working further on that. Uh, and so th that's my answer to that, uh, that question. And just the, the last sticking point, I think, is the one that has just been mentioned by my co-panelists, which is data transfers again. If I had a third one to mention, so let's solve Airbus Boeing, solve steel and aluminium, and let's get data transfer sorted out. And then we'd, we'd be up and away. So there we go. Thank you. And Ambassador, if I may turn to you, you've also been a business person. Are you concerned about uh, lasting protectionist pr pressures uh, in our societies after, after uh, this pandemic and how this may affect uh, transatlantic trade? What can we do to, uh, to resolve this, especially in the context of recovery and our own programs in its continent? I, I think it's terribly important that we find some, some quick successes. I mean, we have a lot of areas where we have some disagreement. Some of, many of these are incredibly intractable. Uh, Airbus Boeing, for example, I think is an easy solution. We got to get that problem solved. Yeah. On the other hand, the complexity, for example, of dealing with agricultural 
subsidies and uh, non-tariff barriers is a, an enormous political problem on both sides of the Atlantic. It, it is far better, far bigger politically than it is from a commercial standpoint, but it tends to, to, to spoil the environment if we don't have some successes in that area. Uh, we also have some places where I think everybody could move and work together. Uh, we've had an enormously difficult time with the pandemic. Uh, we ought to be thinking about how do we, what do we do about the next pandemic and where can we work together to prepare and have be sure that we have a sufficiency of vaccines, sufficiently of P, a sufficiency of PPE, what kinds of reserves should we be putting together? How should we be thinking about uh, manufacturing processes for these kinds of critical elements across the world and particularly both in Europe and in the United States? These are the kinds of things that I think have a political currency and are, most people would agree there's an opportunity. Another area that I think we ought to be working very closely together with, with uh, Europe, again, that's a win-win and not terribly controversial is in the question of rare earths. Uh, the Chinese have basically monopolized on a very strategic basis the, uh, the ingredients for a lot of the information pro uh, processing uh, equipment, uh, the, the chips and what have you. And so I think we need to look very carefully at uh, uh, what our needs are and work with the European Union to ensure that there's an adequacy of supply outside of a dependency on China. Thank you. And uh, Rupert, over to you. Can we build a consensus on trade issues of particular concern to the US, like uh, uh, over dependence on China or uh, Chinese technology or Russian gas? Uh, what's the EU response there? Thank you. Yes, I think we can do much better in that respect. Uh, just to give you an example, I mean, the ambassador just mentioned the whole question of supply chain resilience, which the uh, crisis had put the spotlight on, but which was there before dependencies existed before, and they, uh, they're actually quite limited when you look at the health sector. Um, we've reached out to the new administration because there is a major so executive order being implemented now on supply chain resilience. A similar exercise is going on on the EU side where we are with the DG Grow colleagues have done a major study on dependencies in Europe. We need to compare these results and look at what is really needed by way of intervention. There will be interventions, but I think they should be well-founded and they should be hopefully aligned with what we see as common threats to dependency or risk, risk assessment. I think there is scope for that. There is scope for uh, working on the conflicts as uh, Susan has mentioned. And that has also a, a big, a big um, aspect of uh, supply chains and market distortions vis-a-vis -vis the aircraft market. It's not so much the old fight we had at the WTO, which we've litigated to the end, and we all have our sanctions rights. Now the question is, what kind of aircraft market do you want to have in the future? And just before this event, we heard about hydrogen planes and so on, which will need massive subsidies, and it will not be only the US and the EU who will deal with that. You will have new entrants in the market. So we have to put the focus to the future to get through these events, so these uh, uh, disputes. And of course, on steel and aluminium, everything has been said. We are not a security threat. We have to find a way to deal with the overcapacity. That's the key. Thank you so much. And I'm afraid we're running out of time. So uh, we I don't think there's any disagreement among ourselves that uh, we need a cross-the-board cooperation between the US and the EU to, uh, if we are to give ourselves uh, a chance of completing this, uh, uh, of recovering our economies out of the pandemic and uh, transforming our agenda, the, the economy in both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, I, I would like to thank you all very much for your participation. I look forward, looking forward to more and heading back to the studio with uh, Maggie and Travis.